All righty. Well, good afternoon and welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Andrew Daphne. I'm the Instruction and Outreach Librarian at the New Jersey State Library. And it's my pleasure to present Melissa Johnson for our first program of the new year. Uh, Melissa Johnson is a certified and professional genealogist, writer, and editor. Uh, she has expertise in researching families with origins in New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, and England, and works on forensic cases, dual citizenship matters, and lineage society applications. Um, she also serves on the board of the Genealogical Society of New Jersey and the International Society of British Genealogy and Family History. She also has a bunch of other accolades to her resume as well as she is the reviews editor of the Association of Professional Genealogists Quarterly, Quarterly and the editor of the GSNJ newsletter. So welcome, Melissa. Thank you for joining us today. Um, before we jump into the presentation, uh, we have a few housekeeping items to go over. Um, first and foremost, we will be taking your questions at the end of the program today, but you can submit them at any time using the Q&A feature or the chat feature in the Zoom dashboard. Um, a copy of the handout will be posted in the chat once we get underway so that those who are joining us um, in the next few minutes will have an opportunity to access that. Um, there is a survey that's going to be available at the end of the webinar. If you have time, we ask that you please complete the survey. It really does help us as we evaluate our programming and make sure that we are providing you with uh, relevant programs. Um, and lastly, on our bullet points, um, Regina Fitzpatrick, our genealogy librarian at the New Jersey State Library, has compiled a fantastic genealogy research guide that has a whole host of information from resources to search techniques to some of her previous programming on topics that you can find at the link on the screen. Um, I will be posting a live link of that in the chat in just a few moments, so you'll be able to access that. Uh, one last thing before we jump into Melissa's presentation, um, just a brief overview of the Zoom dashboard uh, for those of you who might not be familiar. Um, this is what your dashboard should look like if you're using a PC or a Mac. Um, if you are using a mobile device, the dashboard is going to look a little bit different, but all of the features will still be there. First and foremost, you have your audio settings in the bottom left hand corner um, that you can check to make sure that if you're using a headset or external speakers that you're connected to them. At any point during the program, if you have a problem, you can hit this raise hand button in the middle. That'll alert me that you are running into some type of issue. I will send you a message in Zoom and hopefully we'll be able to resolve that. And as I mentioned before, for questions, there is the Q&A button or the chat button. You can hit either of them, send us your questions, and we'll be happy to answer them at the end of the program. So that is everything that I have for you. So it is my pleasure to turn it over to Melissa. Thank you so much. Okay, so today we are going to talk about how to use indirect evidence in genealogy to establish proof of a conclusion. So in order to get started, I do want to go over some basic terminology and the terminology that we talk about, I'm going to talk about it in the context of how it's used in the genealogy field. And it may be a little bit different if some of you went to school to be a librarian or studied another field, the terminology that's used in genealogy <clears throat> may be a little bit different when we talk about something being primary versus secondary. We are going to talk about primary and secondary information, not primary and secondary sources. So the genealogy field handles things a little bit differently because we are looking specifically at people rather than looking at history as a whole. So we're going to use a little bit different terminology. And I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page as we move forward um, so that everyone understands what we're actually discussing in the lecture. So <clears throat> some of the terminology we're going to talk about today are sources, information, evidence, and proof. And then we're going to go through what exactly the genealogical proof standard is. We also are going to talk quite a bit about research questions, uh, because in order to establish proof of something, you have to have a question first. So what is a good research question? A good research question is one that is specific and that helps you to figure out what type of research you're actually going to do. Um, it also 
is necessary, as I said, in order to apply evidence, you have to have a question. And in order to prove a conclusion, there has to be a question to start with. So when we talk about research questions, sometimes we may not have a specific question. We may have a larger goal, like to find out everything we can about our grandfather's war service. And that's fine, um, but that's not something that you can provide a specific answer to. You would be gathering more a body of information rather than applying evidence and proving a conclusion. What we're gonna talk about today is a little bit different because we're talking about finding a specific question and proving a conclusion. So in other words, you need a research question because you can't come up with an answer if you don't have a question to start with. So what is a good research question? We need to make sure that our research question is talking about a specific person, <clears throat> number one, and also that we are seeking specific information about that person. So most research questions <clears throat> focus on identity, relationship, or circumstance, and we'll dive into those a little bit more detail. So questions of identity focus on really kind of picking out which one of several individuals is the one that you're interested in. So an example of that would be <clears throat> which John C. Johnson, who was born about 1785 and lived in Newark, New Jersey, was the man who was killed on the railroad in 1857. So in this case, you know that there's a man named John C. Johnson who was killed on the railroad in 1857, but you may not be sure that that's your great, great, great grandfather, John C. Johnson. It may be a different John C. Johnson. So you're trying to figure that out. So this is more of a kind of eeny, meeny, miny, mo a little bit in terms of which one is he? And this question is a good one because number one, it identifies a specific person. It seeks what information, it, it's very specific about what information you are looking for. And it is a question of identity. A question of relationship is different. What, what this does is focuses on linking one research subject to another person. So that could be a set of parents. It could be their child, their sibling, their spouse. So a lot of research questions are questions of relationship because as genealogists, we are constantly trying to find the next generation or try to figure out where our ancestors came from. So in order to do that, we may ask a question like, who were the parents of our ancestor? Such as the question we have here. Who were the parents of William J. Murphy, who was born in 1800 in England and died in 1851 in Newark, New Jersey? And we're actually going to explore that research question a little bit later. This is a good question because it checks all of our boxes. It identifies a specific person, William J. Murphy, who was born 1800 in England and died 1851 in Newark. We wouldn't want to just say William J. Murphy because there are a lot of William J. Murphys in the world. We could have said William J. Murphy, who was the husband of Jane Emery, who lived in Newark, New Jersey. That would be another way to describe that person and make sure he's not able to be confused with another person by the same name. It's very important when you have questions of relationship that you are specific about the person. And if you don't know enough about the person yet, that indicates that perhaps you have a question of identity to work with first before you can really ask a question of relationship. Uh, you need to know some kind of baseline information about the person that you're focusing on in a question of relationship. If you don't, you may confuse him with another person by the same name or three people by the same name, four people by the same name. And then your research won't be as focused because you'll be researching four different people unknowingly. Um, this question is also a good one because we are specific about the information being sought. We are trying to find his parents. Um, we could be trying to find his siblings. We could be trying to find his children. Uh, in this case, we're trying to find his parents. In some instances, we may want to be more specific. We may want to say biological parents. We, we may want to say adoptive parents. So in this case, <clears throat> um, there's no uh, evidence that there was an adoption or anything in place. So you know, we were trying to identify his parents in terms of what we believe his parents, who we believe his parents to be on paper and possibly also biologically as well. 
Uh, if you have a research question that's about, say, an adoptee, um, then your research question may be even more specific to say who were the biological parents because you already know who the adoptive parents were. Questions of circumstance are a little bit different. They focus on some type of event or circumstance in that person's life. So a lot of these questions may be focused on military service or immigration. One example that we have here is when did William Morgan, who was born in England and lived in Newark, New Jersey after 1860, first immigrate to the United States? So again, we have a specific person, William Morgan, who was born in England and lived in Newark after 1860. Um, we wouldn't want to just say William Morgan because there were many William Morgans. We could also say William Morgan, who was married to Elizabeth Geldard and lived in Newark. There's a lot of ways we can describe him, but we do need to describe him in some way. Um, we are specific about what information we're looking for. We want to know when he first immigrated to the United States. And some questions of circumstance may be posed completely differently because they are circumstance questions. They could talk about something totally different than military or immigration. So as we discussed, you do need some solid background information to start. You obviously have a question about this person, so you don't know everything about them, but you do need to know something. Um, if there are unknown details or if there are possible, uh, if there's a possible instance that you're mixing up two different people and you have two different men with the same name and you have information about both of them, maybe land records pertaining to one, but marriage and family records contain related to another, that's, that's going to be need to be sorted out before you really can ask a question about that person. Um, you know, if you have those unknown details or details that you're not really sure they actually apply to your research subject, um, you need to take a step back and focus on figuring all that out with a different research question, probably one related to that person's identity, to separate those individuals and obtain that solid background information before you move forward on, say, identifying their parents. So <clears throat> we're going to take a look at a sample research question. Who was the biological father of Andrew Jimkowski, born in 1923 in Pennsylvania, son of Helena Modzelewski Jimkowski? So this is a question of relationship. We're trying to figure out who his biological father is. We are specific. There's no other person, Andrew Jimkowski, born 1923, who was the son of Helena. That is a very specific person, unique in the world, that cannot be confused with anybody else. So we're going to look at that research question in a few minutes um, and look at how we can take a look at different sources, extract information from them, and apply evidence in relation to that research question. But first, we are going to go over some of that terminology I mentioned. So when we talk about sources in the genealogy field, a source is typically something that is tangible. You can hold it in your hand and look at it. You can bring it up on a computer screen and look at it. So <clears throat> sources are the records that we look at, the deeds, um, birth certificates, marriage records, a tombstone in a cemetery that we can stand in front of, a DNA match list that we can pull up on our computer screen. So what is not a source is the place where we find that information. So the state archives is not a source, that's a repository. We find these sources at archives or courthouses or cemeteries or on ancestry.com, but that's not the source. The source is the actual record, say the deed between John Smith and Jeremiah Jones. That is the source. Sources can be either original or derivative. So an original source is the initial recording of some type of action or event. So if the event is a birth, a source is original if someone shortly after the birth records that birth information on a birth certificate, and then that certificate gets filed in its original form with the state or the county. Um, <clears throat> the same thing goes with a court transcription of, of someone's testimony. Uh, if someone's sitting in a courtroom and they're giving testimony about their sister's divorce and that is being recorded and someone's writing it down right then and there, word for word, and that document is filed with the court papers, that's an original source. 
What would be a derivative source is something created at a later date, and that includes transcriptions of original sources. So if someone took that testimony and they wanted to retype it and they are looking at the woman who's testifying in her sister's divorce's testimony as it was written in 1872 and someone in 1930 is reading that 1872 handwriting and typing it up so that it can be put in a book and then they get rid of the original, that is then a derivative source. It may be completely correct. The person may have been great <clears throat> at reading that handwriting and transcribing everything exactly word for word, but it's still a derivative source. It was created at a later date. And if that original was thrown away, then the derivative source is the best available source there is because that original was thrown away. Another example of a derivative source would be something created at a later date. Say, for example, a birth that took place in 1910 and was not recorded in 1910. Um, and then many years later, <clears throat> that person wants to go into the military, so they need a birth record. So their mother goes and gives all the information to a clerk to provide the birth. She was there. Um, it was <clears throat> created at a much later date. So she might not remember the exact date. She might not remember the time. She might not remember the midwife's name. That's a derivative source. It's being created much later. Um, <clears throat> and when we talk about sources, we can also talk about authored works. So for example, an article that you read in the genealogy journal is a compilation and it's based on looking at many sources, probably a combination of original and derivative. So that's what we call an authored work. So we talk about information. Information is what you find within those sources. So we talked about sources being deeds, birth certificates, tombstones, DNA match lists. Looking at that source overall, doesn't tell us anything other than that it's a deed, it's a birth certificate. When we find information in there, like a purchase date on the deed between John Jones and Jeremiah Smith, that is in useful information maybe for our research question. Maybe it's completely irrelevant information, but yet it's information found within that source. That birth certificate, whether it's original or derivative, it doesn't matter. The birth date in it is a piece of information. Birth date could be wrong, but it's still a piece of information. On a tombstone, if it has the woman's maiden name, that's a piece of information you're finding on a tombstone. And then when you're talking about DNA, if you're looking at a DNA match list, there are lots of different pieces of information in there. There are numbers of shared centimorgans. There's data for how many centimorgans are on each segment <clears throat> within, that, within the person's DNA. So all of these things are pieces of information. And information is either primary or secondary. And this may be a little bit different than how you learned it many years ago, not in relation to genealogy. Primary information is from firsthand knowledge. <clears throat> so someone who witnessed an event, the person who is uh, you know, writing something down minutes after it happened and they witnessed it, they have firsthand knowledge and that primary information has a higher probability of being accurate because the person has firsthand knowledge. Secondary information is a little bit lower probability of being accurate, however, it can be accurate. Um, it's considered to be hearsay, so something that you know from someone else. So when I filled out my marriage license last year, when I got married, <clears throat> um, they asked me where my mother was born, and I put Scranton, Pennsylvania. I wasn't there when she was born in 1951. Uh, I have always heard that she was born in Scranton. I have no reason to believe she was not born in Scranton, but that is considered secondary information when I look at that information on my marriage license or on my marriage certificate. <clears throat> I, I know that from hearsay. Um, I believe it to be accurate. I would bet my life that it's accurate, but I don't know that for sure. So it's considered secondary information. I was not there for it. So overall, both primary information and secondary information can be right, and both of them can also be wrong. So now we're gonna talk about evidence because we are gonna talk quite a bit about indirect evidence. So when we talk about evidence, 
it's something that responds to a specific question. So when we were looking at our sources before and just glancing at them and looking at the various pieces of information, the purchase date on the deed, the mother's maiden name on the tombstone, the birth date on the birth certificate, that's just random information. But when that information is responsive to our research question, it becomes evidence. So evidence is not something that's tangible. It's not something that you hold in your hand. It's something that we develop through our own thought process and it exists in our minds. So when we have a question and a piece of information on a source is relevant to that question, it becomes evidence. In other words, <clears throat> evidence is what we interpret those little pieces of information on the sources to mean. And it's what we're interpreting it to mean in the context of our research question. So it's based on the fact that we have a research question, we have these sources that contain information, and when that information pertains to our research question, we analyze it, we come up with the idea and the concept that it pertains to our research question, we may correlate it with other pieces of information we have that also pertain to our research question. And at that point in time, it becomes evidence, it becomes relevant in terms of answering our research question. <clears throat> so now we're going to talk about the complexity of that evidence. So the evidence can be a simple single piece of information that directly and very easily answers our research question. And when it does, that's called direct evidence. When it doesn't, it's called indirect evidence. It's a piece of information that doesn't directly answer our research question, but when we take that piece of information with another piece of information and another piece of information and some contextual information, and we analyze all of that together, we correlate it together, we interpret it as being relevant to our research question, and then it becomes indirect evidence that we can use to help answer the research question. Another type of evidence is negative evidence, and that's when a lack of information actually suggests an answer to a research question. So it's not the same thing as a negative search. So if we go in and go and look in the New Jersey death index on ancestry <clears throat> and search for someone's name um, and we don't find in, find any hits for it, that doesn't mean that that's negative evidence. What that means is we have a negative search result. Uh, that database may not be complete. We don't know that the fact that the person's name does not appear in there answers our question in terms of providing negative evidence. Um, but we need to think about it some more. It may, the fact that we're not finding something in there <clears throat> may answer our question, but there is a difference between a negative search and negative evidence. <clears throat> so a quick overview of our terminology, we think about sources. Sources are what we look at, the pieces of paper we hold in our hand, pull up on a computer screen, tombstones we see in a cemetery. They contain pieces of information like birth dates, parents' names, places, name, place names, dates, things like that. Those are pieces of information. And when that information responds to a research question, we can call it evidence. So we're going to look at that research question again. Who was the biological father of Andrew Jimkowski, born March 19th, 1923 in Scranton, Pennsylvania, the son of Helena Modzalewski Jimkowski? And we're going to pay attention to that date. Keep that in the back of your minds, March 19th, 1923. So our question basically is, who is the biological father of Andrew Jankowski? We have Andrew's marriage license. He filled this out when he was getting married. <clears throat> uh, it says right on here, name and surname of father, Frank. And the way these are um, put together, the father's last name is not typically included, but it's suggested to be Jim Kosky. So that's on his marriage license. Another source, his birth certificate also provides direct evidence of who his father was. Right here, it says plain and clear, Frank Jim Kosky, age 37, born in Poland. So we have two pieces of evidence there that are direct evidence. Um, those are sources that very clearly state Andrew's father's name. So remember I said direct evidence can be right or wrong and indirect evidence can be right or wrong. 
So <clears throat> we're going to take a look and see what else there is. And this is why research, reasonably exhaustive research, which we'll talk about in a minute in relation to the genealogical proof standard is really important. So if I had just looked at these two documents for my grandfather, I wouldn't have thought anything of it. They both clearly say what his father's name is. They are directly answering the question. So they do provide direct evidence um, answering the research question, but remember direct evidence can be wrong. So looking at the totality of all of the information related to my grandfather and his mother, Helen, we're gonna find some indirect evidence. So Andrew's mother, Helen Jimkowski, in 1927, she had to file a petition to sell her real estate. Um, and this was real estate that she purchased on her own after her husband abandoned her. However, because she was still a married woman, she had to file a petition to sell it um, and basically put a legal notice in the paper notifying her husband, Frank. So in this petition, she says that her husband, Frank, abandoned her in March of 1922. So what does that mean in terms of Andrew's birth date? Remember, I told you to remember that day, March 23rd, 19, I'm sorry, March 19th, 1923. Um, so if Frank abandoned her one year prior to Andrew's birth, could he be Andrew's father it makes you think twice about that direct evidence that was on the previous documents. We have some more evidence here. Uh, Helen and Frank were actually divorced in 1930. And in her divorce petition, she says the same thing that Frank left her in March of 1922. So we have another source, same informant, Helen is telling the same thing. So they're not completely independent. Um, of each other, but we also have another source. So this is a baptismal record. Um, it identifies uh, Andrew's father as in Latin, Frank Jimkowski. However, that name is crossed out and the notation um, from an illegitimate bed in Latin is included in the side margin. So there's a lot of evidence here indicating that possibly Frank Jimkowski was not Andrew's father. And this is all indirect evidence. None of those pages say that uh, Frank was not his father, um, but they indicate that there's another story to be told here. So this is all evidence. It's applicable to my research question. If my question is who was Andrew's biological father, then <clears throat> all of this is relevant. It doesn't prove anything because it's not telling me who the father is, but it is relevant and it helps to start telling a story and painting a picture. And I can start putting all of these puzzle pieces together. That's how we take a look at information and turn it into evidence that's relevant to our research question. Um, and I need a lot more to identify Andrew's father, um, but we have information from three sources that provides indirect evidence that actually conflicts with that very clear cut direct evidence. We have the baptismal record with the cross out, and the petition to sell real estate and the divorce petition that tell a different story that indicate that Frank was not around to be Andrew's father. So in this case, we have direct evidence that provides an answer, but it appears that direct evidence may be wrong. And then we have indirect evidence that conflicts with the direct evidence and points to a potentially different answer. We don't know exactly the answer yet because we can't tell from these documents who the father is. That requires a whole nother body of evidence from DNA and other relationships that Helen had in her life. Um, <clears throat> so keep in mind too that indirect evidence can also be wrong. So it was entirely possible that Helen was mistaken on those documents about when Frank left. And it's also entirely possible that someone at the church didn't believe Helen when she said that Frank was the father. So they did that cross out. That was a possibility. It's not the case, but it was a possibility. Um, so taking a look at indirect evidence, um, Andrew's case can be solved, and that's a whole nother lecture. Uh, his case can be solved by looking at also a body of DNA evidence to identify who his father is. Um, but these documentary sources help to support what that DNA evidence tells a story of. 
So looking at indirect evidence, indirect evidence can be used to resolve research questions of any kind, identity, relationship, or circumstance. Um, and indirect evidence is often used in the genealogy field when there are cases where records are lost. Um, I've solved many indirect evidence, uh, many relationships using indirect evidence for my families in Newark because a lot of Newark records have been thrown away. Um, there are also unrecorded events or events that um, are not fully documented, like, say, the birth of an adoptee who the father is not documented. Um, there are also uh, cases where information is just inaccurate um, on Andrew's birth record. That's one of them. Um, so sometimes when you have a full body of indirect evidence, it can actually be more convincing than the direct evidence. So what I'm essentially saying is just because a piece of paper says something, it's direct evidence, it doesn't mean it's correct. If there's other information out there that tells a different story, like what you saw with Andrew's case, then you need to look at that indirect evidence and not just rely on what that paper clear cut says. So a little bit about the genealogical proof standard. Um, the genealogical proof standard is the kind of method or mechanism for establishing proof in the genealogy field. So once you have met the elements of the genealogical proof standard, you can consider your conclusion to be proven. And that includes a conclusion made with a body of indirect evidence. So taking a look at the genealogical proof standard, the first um, element of that is reasonably exhaustive research. So making sure that you are looking at all of the information available, you're conducting research into a variety of sources uh, related to your research question, you continually refine your research plan based on what you found um, until you have conducted reasonably exhaustive research. So it's not just taking a look on ancestry and family search and poking around there. It may involve a trip to multiple courthouses. It may involve many, many years of online research, turning every page of every book for a county, <clears throat> um, depending on your research question. Uh, the genealogical proof standard also relies on having complete and accurate source citations. So as you can see, the fifth element, all the way jumping to the bottom, is a sound written conclusion. When you write that conclusion, you do need to make sure you're citing your sources. Someone needs to know where your information came from. Did it come from all derivative sources that are not likely to be accurate? We don't know that unless we have source citations that we can evaluate and we can go back and actually look at those documents if we need to. Uh, when you're using a body of indirect evidence, the most important part and probably the, the most complex part of the genealogical proof standard is making sure that you've done that careful analysis and correlation. So typically using indirect evidence to prove a conclusion, you are making an argument and you are having to basically state your case. So you need to analyze and correlate and basically demonstrate what makes complete sense in your head. Uh, you need to demonstrate that for someone else so that it can be written down um, and, and that's the last element of it being proven. Um, if you have any conflicting evidence, um, the conflicting evidence <clears throat> must be addressed and resolved as well. So taking a look at um, any kind of possible other answer to your research question and refuting why that can't be the case is an important element of the genealogical proof standard as well. So once all of these are met, you can consider your conclusion to be proven. So a couple of other pieces about um, reasonably exhaustive research is that basically you are going to analyze your research question and make sure that you have come up with a research plan that includes that that includes sources that every competent genealogist would use. So as I mentioned, not just looking on ancestry or family search and also refining that plan again and again. So if you come up with a research plan, you, you take a look, you go through it all, you have not completed that reasonably exhaustive research. You then look and analyze at what you have found and you redo your research plan. You refine it based on those findings. <clears throat> and you may have to do that five times, 10 times, 20 times 
until you feel as though you have a resolution that cannot be refuted, that meets all the other pieces of the genealogical proof standard. <clears throat> when you're taking a look at your source citations, the most important part of that is making sure that you tell your audience where you got your information. What kinds of records were used? When you are stating someone's birth date, is that coming from a birth certificate or is it coming from Aunt Helen's recollection? <clears throat> if it's a birth certificate, is it an original or a derivative? Is it a typescript short form copy that your grandmother had in her cedar chest? Or did you go and get the original from the state archives? Um, where the information came from is important, <clears throat> but also it's important to make sure that your source citations are clear enough and complete enough so that other people can go and find them again and look at the same information that you looked at when you were working on your research and compiling your indirect evidence argument. Um, and then also source citations should include any kind of negative searches. So when I'm reading an article, it's great that I have all the information that the person came up with in front of me, but I also want to know, did you look for this? Did you look for that? Did you look for that? Because I don't see that in the article. Um, so your source citations should include um, other things that you search for that maybe were unsuccessful searches. And those unsuccessful searches may not mean anything in the grand scheme of things, but it speaks to the depth and breadth of your research. Um, and then also, you know, whether the sources that you consulted, whether they were successful searches that found information that's included, or they were unsuccessful, whether they were appropriate for your overall research question is something that can be evaluated by your readers. Um, if proper source citations are included. Um, so when we talk about analysis and correlation, we always have to keep going back to the research question. So we're taking a look at all of the information, what it means, how it relates to another piece of information you've found, but it's all in the context of our research question because we are creating evidence that helps to respond to that research question. So the analysis and correlation piece really is our logical interpretation of all of the evidence, the totality, the whole body of evidence that we've found. It's our interpretation of what it means in terms of answering our research question. And as I mentioned, this is the biggest piece of using indirect evidence. Um, and then that conflicting evidence, sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Um, I've written indirect evidence, um, case studies, proof arguments where there was no conflicting evidence. And if that's the case, then it doesn't need to be addressed. However, what it does is ensure that if there's another possibility out there that it's addressed and it makes sure that the conclusion can't be overturned by discovering other information in the future. Um, and what that does is helps protect against another answer or explanation that comes up years later when a certain record set is released that wasn't available to you now. Um, so if there is information that has yet to be discovered, which may be the case, there could be an old church book in someone's attic that was not accessible to researchers and the general public, and that surfaces 10 years from now. It's okay if not every bit of information has been found. However, if there are, are big pieces of information that are available and have not been found, that's a red flag. However, if there is something that comes up like a church book found in someone's basement, that's okay. And honestly, if you've done your due diligence and addressed all conflicting evidence and really met the genealogical proof standard, that evidence that comes up should match what your conclusion actually is. Um, and when we talk about the sound written conclusion, the last element of the genealogical proof standard, what this does is it helps to convey what's in your head, that mess of evidence that you've come up with from all of your research over the years. It helps to convey that to your readers um, and it puts it on the record for future researchers. So what else does a written conclusion do that's helpful to you? It helps to identify holes in your logic and possible other conclusions that need to be addressed, that conflicting evidence. So there's no better way to keep all of that 
that's in your head and get it out there. There's no better way to identify kind of your, your weaker points and your holes than writing it all down. And the format of those conclusions in the genealogy field um, are typically either very simple, like a proof statement, if your question is a really simple one that is resolved by direct evidence, then you may just have a simple proof statement. When was Melissa Johnson born? You have my birth certificate. It says I was born August 11th, 1983. And what that basically is, is one document providing direct evidence. That's not something that is an indirect evidence argument. However, a smaller body of indirect evidence could be um, <clears throat> into a proof summary, which is typically a couple of paragraphs, or a proof argument, which is a longer piece, like something you would see in National Genealogical Society Quarterly or another journal, where it's pages and pages and pages of um, information that needs to be presented to prove a conclusion. So we're going to look at indirect evidence and how it applies um, in two different cases. So we're first we're going to look at a question of relationship. Who were the parents of John H. Johnson, who was born possibly February 8th, 1808 in Newark, New Jersey, lived in Springfield, Illinois as early as 1839, was a partner with printer and bookbinder Johnson and Bradford, and died in 1886 in Springfield. So <clears throat> this question is a little bit longer probably than it needs to be because I wanted to give you some background information on the person. Um, if you were to say the parents of John H. Johnson, partner with printer and bookbinder Johnson and Bradford who died in 1886 in Springfield, that would fully identify the person. Um, so that would check that box. Um, we have specific information being sought. We wanna know who his parents are. Um, and again, this is a question of relationship. So what information do we know? What do we start with? We have uh, 1850 to 1880 census enumerations for John in Springfield, Illinois, and they consistently identify his place of birth as New Jersey. Uh, his death certificate in 1886, as well as a 1904 published history of Springfield, Illinois, both name his birthplace specifically as Newark in New Jersey. And then we know that John had six children, uh, Walter, Abby, Maria, Mary Emma, Mary Bell, and Carrie. So we may be able to glean some information from their lives that is related to uh, John's past and his parentage. So if we look at land records in out in Illinois where John lived in Springfield, um, the county land records there uh, link him to several other Johnsons through land transactions, and those Johnsons were from Newark, New Jersey. So we have some good hints there. Um, in 1846, John H. Johnson and his wife Mary provided a mortgage to Isaac F. Johnson of Newark for property in Springfield, Illinois. Uh, in 1853, John C. Johnson of Newark, who was acting as guardian of Jacob Johnson, who was that Isaac's son, authorized our research subject, John H. Johnson, as his representative to cancel that 1846 mortgage. And then if we take a look at Essex County, New Jersey records, we can find John there as well. Uh, our research subject, John, was listed as a debtor at, of Isaac Johnson's estate after Isaac died in 1850. Um, <clears throat> so in 1851, John was listed as a debtor in uh, his administration paperwork. So the link that we have here is Jacob C. Johnson, who is Isaac Johnson's son. Looking at him a little bit, now sometimes we have to dive into researching someone else. Now, who would have thought a few minutes ago that we'd be researching someone named Jacob C. Johnson in order to identify the parentage of John H. Johnson, but the information that we have led us there, so this is where we're going to go. Um, if we look at Jacob C. Johnson, um, he in his lifetime identified Horace of Springfield as the son of John Cummings and Sarah Freeman Johnson and named Horace's children as Walter, Abby, Rita, Carrie, and Mary. 
And he also remembered working in Horace Johnson's bookstore in Springfield and referred to him as his uncle. So now the information that Horace of Springfield was the son of John and Sarah, that's Jacob's recollection. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna take a look a little bit deeper into that. Um, <clears throat> so John H. Johnson is Horace of Springfield. That is fairly obvious from Jacob's statements. Um, he, Jacob was a genealogist and he did a lot of work on his own family history. Um, Horace of Springfield is how he identified um, John as, as son of John Cummings and Sarah Freeman Johnson and named Horace's children as basically the names of John H. Johnson's children. So, um, you know, there were not two separate individuals, a John and a Horace, um, who were um, both in Springfield. So this is one individual, but it does take a little bit of, of analysis to establish that. So in this case, um, <clears throat> you know, it was fairly simple to, um, you know, get to the point of identifying a family for him because he had some, you know, land records that associated him with Jacob and because Jacob um, lived to be about 90 something and recalled his early memories and knew who his father was. So that was not a family tree that was going back 10 generations. And there's also additional information that helps to support um, the assertion Jacob made um, about who, his, who Horace's parents and Jacob's grandparents were. So you know, in other words, there is sometimes um, a record that gives us the information that we want, but when there's not, it doesn't mean that we can't still get an answer to our question. So uh, a lot of the times genealogists, and, and I did this when I was first learning too, you know, we're just searching and searching for some kind of record that names the parents of someone and we may not ever find it. Sometimes it just doesn't exist, it's not there. But we have probably a lot of good information suggesting who their parents are. And if we have that, we don't need that one record that names who their parents are specifically. Um, and especially as you continue to go back in time and there aren't records like that, like birth and marriage records that will um, specifically identify uh, under a line that says mother's name, father's name, who the parents were. So we're gonna look at another question, another research question that's a little bit more specific. Um, and I, some of you may have seen a larger <clears throat> um, case study uh, on this that I've done a couple of different times. Um, so we're gonna just summarize a lot of the information here. Um, I, I do a whole lecture on this case um, and I even have to simplify it for that. But so we're gonna take a look at uh, who were the parents and siblings of William J. Murphy, who was born 1800 in England and died in 1851 in Newark. So this question checks our boxes. It identifies a specific person and makes them unique in the world. You know, there weren't two individuals with these same circumstances. Uh, we know what more information we're seeking, parents and siblings, and this is a question of relationship. So the information that we know when we're going in is not much. Um, that William was born about 1800 in England. He died 1851 in Newark. Um, he does have a death certificate uh, and it does not identify his parents um, at that time in New Jersey. Um, there is no baptismal record that was found for him, any possibilities in England. Again, we don't know his parents' names, so we can't even really verify for sure that there is not one, but nothing jumping out at us. Um, and we don't know of any information about him in England and in the US that names his origins in England, like a specific location. What we do know is that he immigrated to Newark in the early 1830s. Um, he was a shoemaker. He was also Methodist, which was not a common religion in New Jersey at that time. And he lived on what was referred to as the Tollgate Road or Camp Town Road in Newark, which was near Clinton, New Jersey. Um, and then William's children, uh, he had several, their records identify their mother as Marianne Owen or Owens. So we know what William's wife's maiden name was. So uh, without any clear 
direct evidence identifying his parentage, um, we have uh, to dive into his life. We need to look at his friends and neighbors and associates and see if anything gives us any clues. So looking at the 1835 city directory for Newark, we can see that William, who was a shoemaker, lived at 6 New Street. And there's another Murphy, um, not someone in his immediate household, his one of his sons or his wife or anything like that, who lived at the same address. Um, so that's Henry Wilson Murphy, um, who was also a shoemaker. So we're going to take a look at Henry Wilson Murphy. And his life was very similar to Williams. He immigrated to Newark in the 1830s, early 1830s. He, like William, was a shoemaker. Um, also, like William, he was a Methodist, and he was even employed as a sexton at the local Methodist church in Newark. Um, Henry Wilson Murphy, because of his unique middle name, um, we were able to identify a probable birth record for him. Um, records in the US for Henry Wilson Murphy indicate that he was born in England, like William. Um, as you can imagine, most Murphys in the US at this time had Irish origins, not English. Um, so we have a baptismal record for him, 1802 in Lambeth in Surrey, England, which is not far from London. Um, and the parents are identified as James and Susanna Murphy. Um, so Henry was married in 1822 uh, in London. Uh, his wife's name is also known from the names of his, from the records of his children. So we're sure that that's his marriage record. Um, and he fathered children uh, born in Reading in Berkshire, England, before he came to the U.S. So let's go back to William a little bit. Um, William is buried in a large family lot uh, with many relatives, his wife, his several of his children, many grandchildren, even great-grandchildren. And in that uh, family lot is an unknown individual. Um, when I say unknown, that person is not identified in cemetery records. Um, the tombstone simply says grandfather, um, and the tombstone says that grandfather died in 1841. Um, this cemetery was established in 1844, which is probably why no cemetery records identify the burial by name. It was probably a removal from another cemetery um, that was put into that lot after the lot was purchased by the family and after maybe several people had already been buried there. Um, unfortunately, death records in New Jersey, as many of you know, don't exist until 1848. So we can't find a death record for this grandfather who died in 1841. However, there were newspaper death notices and obituaries from that time. Um, and if you look through the 1841 obituaries, just uh, starting from January, going all the way to the end, um, looking for someone whose name may be Murphy, um, since the stone says grandfather, um, also keeping an eye out for someone who's, whose um, name may be Owen or Owens, um, because grandfather could have been Mary's father, uh, William's wife's father. Um, newspaper obituaries um, do identify one person that would be of the correct age, um, as indicated by the tombstone, and that's a James Murphy. So uh, the death notice says that James Murphy in the 81st year of his age had died, and they invite family and friends um, to attend his funeral from the residence of his son William on the Camptown Road. So what we know now um, is basically that William's father's name was James, and he was this old man who died in 1841 in Newark, New Jersey. Um, we also know that Henry, whose life was very similar to William's, had a father named James, according to his baptismal record in England in, from 1802. So it's looking like they are brothers and they both have a father named James and that the James who appears on the 1802 baptismal record for Henry is likely the same man who was buried in William's lot in 1841. Um, but we don't know that quite yet. We don't have enough information. Um, so looking at Henry a little bit more, there are some details about Henry that suggest that he may have also had an association with this older man that lived in Newark and is buried in William's lot. 
So when Henry was enumerated in Newark in 1840, uh, his household included a male over age 80. So that could have been James who was buried in William's lot. Um, also, the Methodist cemetery where Henry was a sexton had its burials removed to other cemeteries in the 1880s. The cemetery was closed down and they did something else with the property. So that may explain why this person was removed in, um, into William's lot. So we don't have any records that support this, but in theory, you know, this older man named James could have lived with Henry in 1840, died in 1841, and it makes sense that if Henry was a sexton at the Methodist Cemetery that his father may have been buried there. Um, and if that cemetery was um, leveled at some point in the future, um, which it was in the 1880s, that the burials were moved other places. Uh, we don't have records of this, but this is just a working theory. Um, so taking a look at William and what other evidence re is related to him that may help connect him to Henry and to this family in England, uh, we do find a marriage record for William Murphy and Marianne Owen in Bradfield in Berkshire, England, which is not too far from Reading in Berkshire, England, uh, where Henry and his wife had children before they moved to the U.S. <clears throat> um, there's a baptismal record for William and Marianne's oldest child, Edwin, there, and it was in the Methodist Church. Um, there still is no baptismal record found for William, but something interesting is that the James Murphy, um, who was Henry's father, who also lived in Berkshire, cannot be found there after 1830, when this family seems to have all come to the U.S., so we have a lot of evidence there. It's shaping up to look like William and Henry were brothers and they had the same father, James. James was this man who was in London or in Surrey when um, in 1802, who later was in Berkshire and later was in Newark, New Jersey. But is that enough? I didn't think so. Um, and that's a quick summary of most of the evidence. There's a little bit more that goes into detail, but. Um, we have autosomal DNA that we can work with as well. So DNA evidence um, is very crucial. It's, if it's available, it should be used um, in any kind of indirect evidence argument uh, that you want to do reasonably exhaustive research um, with. And essentially, if you have DNA evidence available to you and it's not being used, then you really are not going to meet the reasonably exhaustive research uh, element of the GPS. So taking a look at autosomal DNA, if you're not familiar with it, it's DNA that passes from generation to generation through what's called recombination. So every person has autosomal DNA. I have it. I got it from both of my parents. They got it from both of their parents who got it from both of their parents. So everyone has autosomal DNA from a bunch of different ancestors on all of their different lines. So what that basically means is that descendants of William should have little pieces of his DNA. So I identified um, that William had five children who had living descendants. Henry had four children who had living descendants. And I was able to get a good sampling of autosomal DNA tests from 14 descendants of William and nine descendants of Henry to start. Um, and looking at those, they do share DNA. Now, these relationships between William's descendants and Henry's descendants, they would be third, fourth, fifth cousins of different levels of um, uh, with each other. Um, so the DNA that they share is small, but it's there. So Henry's descendants and William's descendants, all of them shared DNA with at least some of the other group of descendants. So this is just a sample of what I started with. Um, the people with the stars next to them um, were original test takers. I have since you know, now at this point, there are probably 60 or 70 test takers among William and Henry's descendants. And I was able to identify um, some other siblings of William and Henry as well. 
Uh, but these are the people who originally tested and all of them matched most of the other ones. And where they didn't match, that could easily be explained because you aren't always going to match everyone who's at that level, third, fourth, fifth cousins. It's okay to not match. Um, if one person didn't match everyone, I would be concerned. But the fact that one person maybe didn't match one or two of the other group um, is not a cause for concern. So looking at these um, DNA matches and their amounts of shared DNA with each other, they are those amounts are consistent with the relationships they had, as I mentioned, third cousins, fourth cousins. Um, and there were no connections found on other lines of those families. For example, um, I did research the other, the other ancestral lines of the people that I took tests with just to make sure that they didn't have another common ancestor with another test taker and that that was the reason for their shared DNA. I did not find any other familial connections. So looking at the evidence recap, we have William and Henry Murphy. They were both born in England, both Methodists, both shoemakers, both came to Newark in the 1830s. We know that William was the son of the older man, James Murphy, who died in 1841 and was buried in his lot. We know that Henry's baptismal record identifies his father as a man named James. Henry and William both have ties back to Berkshire, England. James Murphy, who was definitely Henry's father, cannot be found in Berkshire, England after 1830. And there's shared DNA between William and Henry's descendants that support what the documentary evidence tells the story of is, and essentially that the two men were brothers. DNA supports that. So conveying this in writing is another element of the genealogical proof standard. Um, so this complexity, this is very complex evidence. It requires a big proof argument. Um, this has been written up, I would say it's about 20 pages or so. And most of that is explaining what I just explained to you, um, but in a little more detail and with more specifics, more source citations, and also identifying any conflicting evidence, which in this case, there wasn't really any. Um, the only conflict I can see, and it's, I wouldn't even call it conflicting evidence, is making sure that there weren't any other possible shared ancestral lines. So you are, there is no conflicting evidence, but you have to go through quite, quite a bit to prove that by researching those other family lines. So this is what a body of indirect evidence essentially looks like. Um, and, you know, I'm sure that many of you have this in your trees. Um, you have a body of evidence and you're just not quite sure, does it really, you know, is it enough to prove that I'm right, that this couple is the, the parents of my ancestor who, I, who I've had a brick wall on for many years. Um, and I would encourage you to, you know, take a good look at all of the evidence that you have. Take a look at what you might be missing, where there are holes in your research, what conflicting theories there are, are there other possible parents? Um, and take a look and see if your research meets the genealogical proof standard. Um, I have measured you know, mine and also had peers take a look at mine as well once it was in written form. And you know, we all do believe that it meets the genealogical proof standard. We have, um, we have a belief that we conducted reasonably exhaustive research. Um, I don't think there's anything I haven't, haven't hit that is major. Um, it's possible that some church record could surface in a couple of years. And I have confidence that if it does, it will tell what I believe to I've identified here is that James Murphy was the father of William. Um, I do have complete source citations in my write up. Uh, there is <clears throat> a lot of analysis and correlation that is essentially the the whole premise of the written piece. Um, as I said, there's not really any conflicting evidence. And I did write this up um, for uh, uh, to meet that, that requirement of a sound written conclusion and to show my source citations. Um, so if that's done, then you can have a body of evidence that answers a research question, even when you don't have a record that tells you what the answer to the question is. I probably will never see a record that tells me that my William Murphy of Newark's parents are James and Susanna. Um, but I do believe I've identified his parents as James and Susanna, and I've identified a family for him in his siblings. Um, and I've since been able to go on and identify 
parents for James and Susanna as well. So I continue my research just as if I had a record that told me his parents' names. Um, and I am happy to answer any questions um, if there are any. All right, great. Thank you so much, Melissa. If anybody does have questions, please feel free to either submit them into the chat um, or use the Q&A feature in the, uh, the dashboard. So um, we can get started. Uh, somebody asked if the State Library is open now for research. Um, currently, from last week and this week with the uh, governor's orders on state employees and scaling back to um phase two of, of of the reopening we are only open for state employees at for the rest of this week um, we are waiting on further advice to see if we are keeping this schedule moving forward if not then we will be open um to the public monday through friday from 10 a.m to 3 30 p.m um, we strongly recommend going to our website um, and you can find out information about making an appointment there because we are allowing a limited number of visitors into the library at any given time. We can go back. Um, where do you have to go to search for these types of questions? Um, so I, I want to make sure I'm understanding the question correctly. I assume you're talking about research to conduct the research to answer these types of questions. But if that's not correct, um, please, please feel free to, to jump in. Um, uh, it really depends on the question. So, you know, my my suggestion to you would be to take a look at what your research question is and to dive into possibly any kind of research guides for the area, the, the local area, say Monmouth County, New Jersey, or uh, Los Angeles County, California, whatever it may be, or it could be a, an area in Ireland or Germany, um, and take a look at you know what sources are available um, for that location. And you'll find that many of them are probably going to be online. Many of them are probably you know, on records that may be held by the Family History Library and you need to go to a center and log in to to access them, um, or you know, some of them may only be located in person. So it really kind of understands. Um, it really, it really depends on what the um, research question actually is. So I, if I misunderstood that question, please feel free to let me know. Um, can you show us an example of a source citation for a negative search? Um, how does a negative source get referenced in a proof of in a proof or conclusion, i.e., usually sources are in footnotes or bibliographies? Sure, I'm actually going to. I have, gave a lecture the other day, so I have this handy um, coincidentally. So I'm going to share my screen again. Um, so it kind of depends um, if you are um, you know, writing a research report or writing more of an article and you're trying to put a footnote in. But so when you are citing a negative search, you know, you want to make it clear that you looked for a certain thing and you did not find it so that someone doesn't think you were remiss in your in your research. Um, you want to definitely include kind of the full information for what what was searched. So you know, who you search for, what was searched, the location, um, the time period, you know, all of those details. So for example, um, if it's a collection where you're looking at actual certificates on microfilm, you know, you might write in your, in your footnote that, um, you know, that this is what you search, New Jersey Department of Health, marriage certificates, 1915 to 1920, how they're filed might be important, that they're at the state archives, and that you searched for um, all surnames beginning with M-A-R and M-E-R. So that's for kind of more of like a manual search. Um, if you're searching for something in a database, there's some more information to include in there. Um, you know, for example, um, you know, this, this is not correct because it, 
it's different years, but um, you know, the New Jersey births um, database on ancestry that you did wild card searches and you did in, did them for this range of years, which that range of years would not be correct for a 1901 to 1903 database, but, um, and that you did that search on February 14th, 2019, because in 2020, they may add hundreds of thousands of more records to that database and extend the years. Um, so you definitely want to note the date that you um, searched it. Um, in terms of actually writing um, in, into a narrative or something like that, there are two examples right here that I think probably more speaks to the question that was asked um, of kind of how to nicely phrase it in a, in a write-up or in a footnote. <clears throat> um, but something you might write is basically this collection indexed on this website was searched unsuccessfully for this person and then any parameters you use to search. So in here, you're saying the 1860 census indexed on family search was searched unsuccessfully for an individual named Horace Johnson, born about 1848, who lived in New Jersey. So what that tells the reader is that the person went to family search to the 1860 census and typed in Horace Johnson, 1848, New Jersey. Um, and then, you know, if, the, if it's a little bit more complex, um, the second example here um, kind of focuses a little bit more on, on, you know, the record at first. So no baptismal record for this person, child of this, this couple, was found during a page-by-page -page search of this year's baptismal register for this church in this place. So you want to try to include as much information as you can, but these are kind of how I usually phrase it if that was kind of more what the question was um, in a in a report or a footnote or even sometimes in a narrative, um, depending on how important it is and on where to place that negative um, search information. All right. Can you use indirect evidence to apply to join a heritage society? If not, what would you suggest? Um, it depends on the society. Some will accept that information and some will not. So I would definitely check with them. Um, you know, it, if they do allow it, you know, then I, I would suggest maybe running it by a researcher, like once you have it written up, just to, to make sure that it's, um, you know, it, it meets standards and, and things like that. Um, I probably wouldn't suggest having it submitted by a researcher. I would have it submitted by you. Um, just, I, I, I know some societies um you know don't like to see a genealogist involved um but yeah I, I, it really just depends on the on the society so i i would i would check in with them um somebody asked if this will be available for viewing somewhere yes this is being recorded um a link will be sent to everybody who registered and it will be up on our youtube channel probably either later today or tomorrow so you can look for that um, I'm trying to find out if my grandfather from the Ukraine in the 1890s was adopted. So I guess maybe they're looking for any help finding information or what they should look for. Um, yeah, I, I don't know specific, I don't do research in the Ukraine, um, but I would definitely take a look and see if there are some books or research guides that might help identify like assuming it's a baptismal or birth record for the person that there there might be um you know like two sets of records like a, a birth and a and a post adoption record um i know you know in the 1890s just like here in other many other places sometimes adoptions were more informal and they um they were not you know as as formalized as they are today where you're going through a court um, but I would, I would definitely take a look and see it may be that the person was in a church orphanage and there may be some records there for that. I would, I would look, um, you know, for the birth record first and see what you're finding or not finding and then kind of go from there. Um, the other thing I would do too is try to find as many records about the person, assuming they immigrated, you know, in the U.S. because they may have, you know, for example, put 
one set of parents' names on their marriage record and then another set on some kind of, you know, immigration you know, related records or something like that. So you may have some ideas to work off of there. So, you know, obviously any vital records, any kind of immigration or citizenship records, um, or social security records, things like that, anything where they would have put their parents' names, I would, I would definitely start digging for that as well. Um, and then also DNA. So DNA doesn't lie if the person was adopted, um, you know, that's it's, it's going to show their adoptive or their biological family. Um, so I would definitely look at that route too. Um, if could you put your contact information in the chat? We've had a few people ask about contacting you and if you do like one on one sessions with with people. I do. Yep, I can put that in the chat. Uh, somebody said, if I understand you correctly, ancestry and family search searches are not enough to meet the GPS. Um, I would say generally that's correct. So, you know, in order to meet the genealogical proof standard, you don't want to just do online research. There are probably many records that you're going to need to look at um, that are not online um, in order to, you know, fully meet the genealogical proof standard. Um, how has the closures of archives impacted your searches? And are you able to find sources online? Um, so it, it's definitely been a challenge over the last couple of years to, you know, complete everything the way that you would want to complete it. So, you know, there's a lot that can be found online and more and more is coming online, but it really depends on the research problem. You know, there are some cases that I've been able to complete online completely during you know, the last two years over COVID, and there are some that, you know, unfortunately, what's online is just not not enough, and I need to wait to get into an archive. So, um, it really depends on what you're looking for, what the time period is, what the location is. Um, but you know, in in most cases, I it's it's not very often that I, I have cases that can be solved 100% online, usually, you know, even if it's 75% online, and I need to run in and get a couple of vital records and a couple of wills or something like that. Um, the, you know, the, it, there's usually some element of in person research, and it's, it's been difficult. Some places are doing mail orders, though. So I would take a look if a location is closed, they may still be doing um fulfilling mail requests and things like that so um yeah right, uh, these two questions go go together um to what extent is dna being used as proof um and somebody expanded a lot as proof of lineage to an ancestor and especially with dar um so i uh, the, I'm not 100% sure, uh, as I haven't really done one in a while, but I know <clears throat> um, the DAR was using some DNA evidence, but not autosomal DNA last I checked, um, but so I'm not 100% sure I could be wrong on that, but, um, you know, it, it, it depends, uh, like I said earlier, on the society, but, you know, I think that people are, you um, you know, more open to, um, D, more open to using DNA in some instances. And I see a, a comment in the chat, it looks like DAR is still not using autosomal DNA. They're just using Y-DNA um, at this point in time. So someone is a, a former registrar, they just noted that. Um, but, you know, a lot of societies too, and I should have mentioned this earlier when someone asked, um, you know, you can write up a, some, some lineage societies, you can write up a, a proof argument and send it in. Um, but if the proof argument is published in a reliable journal, I think you do have a higher chance of having that be used. Um, now, if they completely don't use autosomal DNA and that argument is based a lot on autosomal DNA, then that may not work for you. But, um, you know, a published proof argument, um, you know, is, is probably holds a little bit more weight than just something that you're sending in, but it really just depends, unfortunately. Um, if a census record really mutilated the spelling of a last name, yet names and birthdays match, can it be considered primary information? 
Um, so <clears throat> a census record, you know, when, you, when you're looking at the information that's in there, um, so census enumerations overall, I, I would say, you know, as long as it's not something that somebody typed into like one of those census forms, um, you know, the, the information on there, it, you know, censuses are considered to be mostly original. It, it, censuses are a little strange because the ones that we're looking at are actually copies of the originals, but this is the best that we have right now. So they are, um, you know, original sources you know, in terms of primary information. It really kind of depends on the information that you're you're looking at. So, you know, like I said earlier, my the fact that my mom is born, you know, in Scranton, I don't know that. So it, it really depends what pieces of information on the census um, you're looking at. So if you're focusing on, I guess, the spelling of a last name, um, you know, the, the names and birth dates are things, you know, for a 10 year old, a 50 year old are, are things that are being recalled many, many years later. So I think the names are pretty reliable in terms of, you know, if you're focusing on reliability, um, but, you know, the, the birth dates still would not be primary information. Um, I hope that answers the question. I know it's a little tricky because um, it, you know, it's not, it's, it's not the census overall that's primary information. It's the little bits and pieces of information that are included on it. And you have to evaluate each one independently. Um, how would one find records for psychiatric institutionalization in Pennsylvania, um, circa 1900 and 1930? Um, so that's going <clears> to <throat> probably depend where the records are actually located will probably depend on whether it was a private or public facility. If it's a public facility, I would look to potentially the, the state archives, but most of those records, unfortunately, are going to be closed because they are dealing with mental health. Um, and that's the case even if the person is deceased. Um, when do you give up a search? Where do you, where do you define reasonably exhaustive? Um, so I don't know that there's any, any searches I've totally given up on. So there's ones I've maybe taken a break on. Um, but if, if you have a search that has been difficult, um, you know, I would try, you know, if you are not getting anywhere with records and you really feel like you've turned every possible page, you know, you can find in terms of documentary sources and you're just not finding an answer, um, I would maybe look to the DNA to see if DNA can help you. So, you know, sometimes we get as far as we can get and we need to just take a break. I wouldn't say you give up because something new could always come into play. There's DNA now that wasn't really around 20 years ago. Um, so I, you know, I would, I would define, you know, reasonably exhaustive based on the project and kind of what's available. But if you haven't done anything with DNA yet, I would say you have not met reasonably exhaustive research. Uh, how would one find the names of bars or tap rooms in Philadelphia circa 1920 to 1950? Um, I would check the city directories for that time. Um, you know, you probably will find some ads in there and usually aside from kind of listing people there were categories in the fronts or the backs of the city directories for different um you know like if you were looking for a, a salon like to do your hair there was a listing for that there's probably a listing for for bars um in in those directories possibly as well i mean how would one locate court transcriptions for from criminal trials in or near Shenandoah, PA, circa 1915 to 1945? Um, so it, if they were county level courts, um, I would check with the county and see what they have retained in terms of their criminal courts. Um, I, would, I think that in my experience, most counties in Pennsylvania and even elsewhere, they don't really have transcriptions from the trials. They have some kind of record and it, it's not gonna be as detailed 
as you know every everything that was said during during a trial and depositions and things like that but rather it would say this person was charged with this offense and they were found guilty or they pled guilty or whatever it is um, so I don't know that you're going to probably maybe find exactly what you're looking for. Um, so that's if it was a county court, if it's a state court, I would look to the state archives. And if by chance it was a, a federal crime, then that would be the National Archives. Alrighty, thank you so much, Melissa. That is all the questions that we have. Um, if anybody does think of anything else, um, Melissa has put her email in the chat. Um, I will also be including it in my follow-up email that will include a link to the recording. So um, I'd like to thank Melissa again for a fantastic presentation, very succinct and very, very well done. So. Thank you so much for having me. I always enjoy lecturing for the library. So thank you, Andrew. Have a good day, everybody. Yes, and thank you for everybody attending. Uh, be safe, be well. And again, if you are interested in doing research, um, just check our website. It'll have the most up-to-date information about uh, members of the public in, in our visitation policies. So um, everybody have a great day.